Ola, and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, these these interventions were forwarded to individual patients and groups of patients um, in a framework in which they were monitored and data collected uh, as therapy of whatever uh, came as therapy was was administered. Um, this framework then kind of went into cold storage because thankfully the world did not encounter a, such a major crisis till we had COVID-19 about six months ago. When this framework, Muri framework, again re-emerged as one of the possible frameworks on which to base research um, uh, during these times, during uh, uh, the times of, of, of the pandemic. Now the pandemic has, uh, uh, while it has opened new challenges to all of us, it has also provided new opportunities. Of course, the challenges have been in the management, in containment, in, in survival, medical as well as economic survival and the political impact and so many other fallouts. And we are still grappling with how to contain them as some parts of the world open, the others remain closed. We in Pakistan are also in a, a, a juncture in which our numbers are very reasonable. Which is that North America and parts of Europe and even Iran have seen or what India is seeing right now. So we've been a bit lucky in that situation and hopefully our luck will also um, uh, stand. So, this, this experience has also given us a lot of opportunities to learn from. Um, we've learned how to diversify our strategies in various areas. We've learned how to, um, for instance, work remotely, work from home, to teach remotely, to learn remotely using the internet and the various modalities through the internet, which we had initially shunned, but now we are using like this webinar that was taking place. Um, we have been able to address and strengthen public health uh, uh, interventions. Um, public health remained a orphan area for much of the world, unfortunately, even though uh, uh, much of the world has been grappling with public health issues. But this has actually been an eye-opening opportunity for the rest of the world, or entire world, to grapple with these situations. That is one opportunity that we have actually dealt with and we should carry on forward. This has also been a reality check on our research abilities and our abilities to do things fast. Uh, vaccines, for instance, take years and years and years to develop. However, we are on a fast track. Maybe something will come out of it, maybe it won't. Similarly, research uh, for the what is the best possible therapy, what is the best possible prophylaxis, etc. There have been many um, dead ends which have actually been explored and found to be dead ends in this um, um, period of about four, five, six months. Some are still being explored. So there is a lot to be learned from this. Uh, now, coming back to Muri, uh, we uh, thought that um, since several research projects in Pakistan and the rest of the world were being framed on this framework, we needed to learn a little bit more about this. And now that those research projects have actually come to an end and we have data, where do we go beyond that? So we've applied the MURI framework and we've come to some raw data, some data which makes some sense and does not make some and does not make a lot of sense also. But how do you take it beyond into the to what level and what is it that follows next? Which is why we've done um, uh, uh, this, this particular webinar in which we've got uh, our two uh, panelists. So uh, to start off, we will have uh, uh, Dr. Andreas uh, Reis, We'll be talking about the road to Muri, and following him will be um, Dr. Asim, who will be talking about the road beyond Muri. So, Andreas is a co lead of the Health Ethics and Governance Unit in the Research for Health Department of the Division of the Chief Scientist at WHO in Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, he's a medical practitioner, uh, started off as a medical practitioner, practicing internal medicine in Germany, France, and in Chile, and then pursued studies in health economics, and then obtained a postgraduate degree in biomedical ethics. Dr. Rice has uh, many areas of, of interest, uh, including public health, and his focus in public health has been the ethical aspects of infectious diseases and outbreaks 
of emerging pathogens. Hence, his, um, uh, he's a very relevant speaker for today. Uh, he has uh, lectured and organized trainings for WHO in more than 50 countries over the years, and in fact has been a faculty at the CPEC um, uh, Masters and Diploma programs that we offer here at Karachi in, uh, at, through the Center of Biomedical Ethics and Culture. Um, he has written extensively in this area also. So he will be talking initially about uh, how we came about um, the, the MUTI framework. Following uh, Dr. Reis, and I'll, uh, I will uh, introduce um, the second speaker also, Dr. Asim Ahmed. He is presently the Dean and the Chief Nephrologist at the Kidney Center Postgraduate Training Institute in Karachi, uh, Pakistan. He received a fellowship in, uh, from the Fogarty International Center of the National Institutes of Health, uh, through which he acquired a Master's in Bioethics from the Joint Center of Bioethics, uh, University of Toronto in Canada in 2003. He is the founding member of the Bioethics Group at the Alhan University. He has also received a planning and then a training grant from the Fogarty International Center and grants from the Wellcome Trust as well as the USAID, through which he was able to direct and teach a master's in bioethics program at the Alhan University some years ago uh, that was being offered. He is a member of the WHO Ethics Expert Group for COVID-19, hence a very relevant person in this particular webinar. His interest in, is uh, especially in research ethics, in disasters, and uh, he has been a part of the working group for disaster research and ethics. He's also got extensive um, uh, experience in ethical review in, in emergency situations as a member of the ethical review board of the Medicine Science Frontiers, MSF. Uh, and he has written extensively on uh, disaster ethics in journals and has published two book chapters. So I think without much further ado, I would request uh, uh, Dr. Reese to present his um, talk, which will be followed by questions and answers specifically for him. And then uh, Dr. Ahmed will uh, present his talk followed by questions and answers. And then we will have a more general uh, discussion uh, with the, both the panelists. So over to you, uh, Andreas. Andreas, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Salam alaikum to uh, everyone um, in this uh, webinar. I first want to thank very much uh, Amir Trapari and uh, Farad Moazam for this. Uh, kind invitation and I also want to congratulate the Karachi Center for Biomedical Ethics and Culture uh, for organizing uh, yet another uh, seminar on ethics and COVID. Um, some of you might know that uh, CBEC is a WHO collaborating center for bioethics and um, I have had the uh, uh, pleasure of uh, visiting um, the center about two years ago and was very impressed by the incredible range of activities that are ongoing, not only in terms of teaching, but the center is also world renowned for uh, doing films on, on bioethics and uh, um, is also a great hub for the Emerald region and, and many countries in the region um, for bioethics. So thank you very much uh, again for for organizing this uh, timely seminar on, on a, a topic of very high importance to WHO. So what I'm going to do in my talk is uh, to first uh, discuss the sort of historic origins of the concept of monitored emergency use of unregistered and experimental interventions. And then I will say um, a few things about uh, WHO's current activities in this area. And um, we will then, um, uh, I will then hand over uh, to uh, Dr. Ahmad, who will uh, be discussing uh, more sort of the current issues and, and practical um, issues that arise. So um, to give you a, a bit of a historic background on the concept, um, basically, sorry, um, this uh, concept of Murray 
originated during Ebola 2014. Um, on the 6th and 7th of August, there was a meeting of the Emergency Committee of the International Health Regulations, uh, which declared the Ebola um, epidemic in um, Western Africa a public health event of international concern. Um, and this was really the biggest um, Ebola outbreak uh, um, until then. The committee uh, stated that this constituted an extraordinary event in public health risks to other states because of several factors. One, the virulence of the virus. Two, the lack of vaccines and available treatment. Three, there was intensive community and health facility transmission patterns and four weak health systems in the host countries. And only um, four days later, actually, um, WHO convened already an ethics advisory panel. So this was really one of the first um, international um, consultations that WHO had called for was on ethics. And um, the reason was the following. Um, there were no uh, specific um, treatments available and uh, only a few substances had shown um, some uh, level of efficacy in the lab or in, in animal models, um, but had not been evaluated for safety and efficacy in humans. So the question was whether these substances, um, given the situation, um, should be given to um, patients um, who were you know, dying um, at a very high rate. The mortality rate reported uh, was uh, 40, 50, 60%, um, depending on the um, different uh, treatment facilities. So a very exceptional um, situation. And in this situation, WHO called for an expert consultation um, of uh, you know, 12 advisors. There were four resource persons mainly from uh, clinical care and, and statistics. Um, and the mandate was to consider and assess the ethical implications for clinical decision-making of the potential use of these unregistered interventions. Um, and only a day later, um, a report of this uh, panel uh, was published the ethical considerations for the use of unregistered interventions for Ebola viral disease. And what did the advisory panel say? Um, this is basically the essence of this report and I'll, I'll read it. In the exceptional situation of the current Ebola outbreak, there's an ethical imperative to offer the available experimental interventions that have shown promising results in the laboratory and in relevant animal models to patients and people at high risk of developing the disease. Um, and in addition, um, the panel um, stated that there was a moral obligation to collect and share data rapidly and transparently. Um, this caused a lot of uh, echo in the media and um, in the uh, scientific publications, there was a lot of endorsement. Uh, I would say probably the uh, majority uh, was in favor of uh, this uh, panel's recommendations, but there was also quite a lot of criticism, um, especially in terms of the uh, experts and the representation um, at, uh, on the panel, but also um, more on the um, conceptual issues. In any case, um, this uh, really led um, to the development of a WHO guidance document, um, which uh, um, took uh, some time to publish. But in 2016, um, this uh, document was published. It's called Guidance for Managing Ethical Issues in Infectious Disease Outbreaks. And it is, uh, uh, and until this day, really WHO's um, standard document on ethics and uh, epidemics. 
And one of the chapters that is highlighted here is in fact on the emergency use of unproven interventions outside of research. Um, and this chapter really reflects um, uh, basically the statement of the panel in 2014, but uh, included um, some more additional elements. So this guidance point uh, number nine in the WHO uh, guidance um, first recognizes that there are many pathogens for which no proven effective intervention exists. WHO has also established a blueprint for research and development uh, for these uh, about 20 diseases um, that uh, have epidemic potential, but there's uh, no proven um, effective intervention um, as yet. Um, at the same time, for some pathogens, there are um, at least initial safety and efficacy data in lab and animal models. And under normal circumstances in sort of uh, peacetime, you know, they would be tested in clinical trials over the years in the different phases, you know, phase one, two, three, four. And this would normally uh, take a couple of years. But uh, in exceptional circumstances, such as outbreaks characterized by high mortality, um, it can be ethically uh, defensible to um, uh, offer experimental interventions outside clinical trials. Um, the uh, expert group also cautioned um, uh, to use the word compassionate use in this uh, context, as actually it uh, sort of uh, implies some kind of compassion on the side of the physician meaning that um, you're convinced that you're doing some good, whereas actually um, uh, if there's a lack of safety uh, data in humans and uh, potential for harm, um, the experts thought that it was uh, inappropriate to call the use of these unproven interventions um, compassionate due to the risk in involved. Actually, you might be doing more harm than, than good. Um, yeah. So the guidance advises that in exceptional circumstances, it is um, ethically permissible to use uh, these uh, substances outside of clinical research, uh, but there were uh, nine conditions that the document called for. So number one is that um, at the moment, there is no proven uh, treatment available. Um, the second condition is that um, basically the gold standard is to um, organize and, and uh, uh, initiate clinical trials. And only if that is not possible uh, for several reasons, um, then it would be permissible to um, uh, use this uh, concept of Murray. Um, there should be at least some data on efficacy and safety available uh, on which to ground on uh, the, the use of this uh, substance. Uh, it's not that anything goes, you have to make a reasonable scientific uh, you know, uh, claim. There has to be some kind of foundation to use uh, and convincing foundation um, to use these substances. Fourth, uh, and this is very important for this uh, seminar, of course, there has to be um, an approval uh, not only by the national uh, regulatory authorities uh, or other competent bodies in that area, depending on the country, but also by appropriate ethics committees. And uh, this is uh, most, in most countries, this would be research ethics committees, but in some countries that can also be uh, clinical ethics committees. Fifth, the risks to uh, participants have to be minimized as much as possible. Um, six, um, the patient has to be um, uh, told about the risks and certainly has to be uh, told that uh, uh, the treatment is uh, you know, not yet approved. It is experimental um, and that there are um, higher risks than, than usual. Um, and um, it's very important to uh, get the informed consent by the patient and also to avoid 
therapeutic uh, misconception, which uh, is a, a common uh, issue, not only in clinical trials, but uh, especially also in, in Murray. And finally, as uh, said on uh, previously, there's a moral obligation to collect uh, data and also to rapidly share the data um, with the world so uh, we can learn from these uh, um, um, you know, uh, non-research uh, interventions um, and uh, the world can benefit um, from this. Um, so far to the sort of historic uh, perspective on Murray, I now want to uh, briefly talk about uh, WHO's activities on ethics and COVID and Murray. So some of you might know that um, in February of this year, we already established an expert group on ethics and um, COVID-19. The initial focus was on research, but uh, very soon it became clear that um, there are many ethical issues that have to do with the response and that need to be treated as well. Um, since then, we have established uh, several subworking groups for particular topics uh, and included additional expertise. And we have been working not only with the WHO R&D uh, blueprint team, but also with other um, technical units at WHO and other working groups, uh, notably the social science working group. Um, the WHO uh, ethics uh, unit uh, which I'm co-heading has also been convening a number of uh, webinars and uh, doing outreach uh, activities, um, in particular through the uh, FEPRIN network. Um, I'm not sure you can read this. This is the uh, membership of our expert group. It's really just to say that it's quite a diverse uh, group from all corners of the world with a lot of different expertise. Um, this uh, ethics expert group has really um, supported WHO well in developing several documents um, which have been published as WHO ethics guidance on the number of topics. So um, considerations on uh, COVID-19 research, a policy brief on uh, resource allocation priority setting, um, emergency standard operating procedures for research ethics committees for rapid ethics review. And this is um, really um, a topic that uh, um, uh, ASIM has been uh, leading all the way back to uh, a joint workshop uh, with him in uh, Nigeria on uh, Lassa fever. Um, so he's uh, the main, main author of, of this uh, WHO uh, uh, publication. Um, then human challenge studies in COVID-19 and uh, finally um, using apps for proximity tracking or, or contact tracing purposes, which is a uh, uh, very hot potato in, in many countries. Um, and uh, then there were also some documents that weren't published under the uh, WHO Ethics Working Group um, under WHO's uh, uh, name, but in, in journals. So for example, one on key ethical concepts such as solidarity, equity, vulnerability, and liberty, which was published in the Journal of Public Health Ethics. And then um, a paper on restrictive measures and social distancing, which was uh, published on the um, FEPRA network uh, website. All these uh, publications you can access um, on our website, which you see here. And we can certainly uh, share the slides later on, so there's no need to you know, scribble it uh, down quickly. One of the topics that are of uh, uh, big concern to WHO and also to the ethics working group is precisely um, the use of unproven interventions. Um, as during Ebola, uh, we again have a situation where there is no specific treatments or vaccines for COVID-19 at the moment. Um, there are a few uh, you know, supportive measures or uh, uh, that have uh, you know, proven um, effective, but nothing really specific has been uh, developed so far. 
At the same time, we have a strong pressure on physicians to offer treatments. And of course, there's also an, uh, an ethical duty for, uh, to care for physicians. Um, so they're you know, hard uh, pressed uh, uh, by the uh, patients, by the families to at least do something. Um, and what we have been seeing is that there are many interventions being used outside of clinical trials. For example, uh, the use of uh, plasma, uh, ivermectin and, and other uh, many different uh, substances, herbal uh, uh, substances and so forth. Um, and um, I already talked about the therapeutic misconception. I think uh, many patients don't really understand that uh, um, what they're getting often uh, lacks the um, scientific uh, basis or it's not a, a, at least an approved um, intervention. And uh, often we see also the unjustified use of uh, unproven interventions under the Murray label. Um, there's a tendency to sort of replace clinical trials, although it would be possible in a given circumstance by um, using uh, a Murray setting. Also seen that some uh, uh, researchers or clinicians are um, submitting, are not submitting their um, uh, you know, unproven interventions to ethics review, uh, claiming that actually it's more of an observational study and, and not a clinical trial. Um, what we also see is there's a lack of adequate ethical and regulatory oversight in many countries. Um, there are a few uh, high income countries that have uh, quite uh, stringent regulations, but then there are many where um, um, modalities such as expanded access or off label use, uh, let alone Murray. Um, are not really uh, regulated. Um, there's also a lack of familiarity <clears throat> with the Murray concept, um, which means uh, um, there's a need for uh, more of uh, seminars and, uh, like this and, and uh, teaching and dissemination. Um, and finally, there's a need for reviewing and clarification of this concept in the context of COVID-19. Um, uh, against this backdrop, the WHO uh, a few weeks ago has established a subgroup on ethics and Murray. Um, it is chaired by Ross Upshur from uh, Toronto and the lead writer is Ignacio Mastroleo from Buenos Aires who has uh, um, you know, spend a lot of time researching on these questions. The mandate is really to review um, the Murray concept in light of its use since 2014, and also 2018 during the uh, latest uh, um, or second last uh, Ebola outbreak to clarify where it is needed, the justification, the conditions for its use, and to prov provide further guidance to the WHO's member states with a, a view to producing a WHO guidance document. Um, this work is done in close collaboration with the WHO expert group, group on clinical management. And also we have involvement, uh, strong involvement from the regulatory um, colleagues um, as the regulatory authorities are one of the um, key target audiences for this uh, document as are clinicians, researchers, but also um, ethics committees. And uh, we hope we can uh, publish this uh, document, which uh, is in, in its uh, fourth or fifth draft at the moment. Um, we hope we can publish this in the next uh, couple of weeks. And uh, with this, I look forward um, to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas, for a very, very enlightening talk because uh, you've clarified a lot of concepts that were fuzzy, as you yourself mentioned. Um, 
the business of Luri is completely new for us. Uh, but the researchers have been using various frameworks. Uh, the RCTs have been the gold standard. However, in the abbreviated time in which they have had to do research and uh, with the, whatever constraints that they have during the pandemic, this has been somewhat of a convenient framework on which to base their uh, their efforts as, as to data gathering. Um, as you've already clarified uh, uh, its development. Um, so there are several questions that, have, that are coming your way and uh, for the participants, um, um, uh, please write your questions in the chat box and uh, my associate Swaleha, uh, who uh, she'll be she'll be compiling them and then she'll be um, um, asking the questions on your behalf uh, with some interaction. Now, but uh, Andreas, I want to start off by saying you already clarified that the term compassionate use is a is a is a disservice because uh, you can't apply compassion in the situation of compassion in this situation because we really don't know whether this will actually work or not. This may actually even be harmful the intervention that we are testing out. But there are other terms that are overlapping. Muri is a, a, a new, new kid on the block, but there have been other terms like expanded access that you mentioned or off-label use. How much of a similarity do those concepts uh, that, that are used by the FDA and the rest of the world are, uh, uh, and how much of an overlap is there with MURI or is MURI still very different from expanded use, for instance? And I ask you in the context that many of our trials that we were conducting uh, under this framework of MURI in Pakistan have now come to an end and they've wanted an extension of an expanded use. Now that we've got this data, we want an expanded use. Now, the, is it the same thing? Is it different? So I'd like your views on that. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. That is a very important question. So um, I think it is um, yeah, clear that there are different uh, terminologies uh, and not all countries uh, use, the, use them uh, in the same sense. So I think uh, commonly the off-label use is really um, the use of uh, uh, medication that is uh, already um, licensed that uh, for one particular um, disease um, for an unapproved indication or in an unapproved uh, age group and um, or there can be a different dosage or maybe a, a route of administration. So they're, they're different uh, sort of it's, it's used differently than for which um, it um, you know has been already uh, licensed and um, so it's, it's generally legal unless it violates uh, ethical guidelines uh, or, or safety uh, regulation. Um, expanded access is uh, more similar to um, compassionate use. And um, it's basically for uh, patients with uh, immediately life-threatening uh, conditions or serious disease um, and uh, getting access to an investigational medical product. Now, um, Murray is, is uh, very specific in the sense that um, it came out of a, a, a context where actually there were um, no uh, medications with any uh, patient data whatsoever. So um, basically uh, substances that had only um, animal and, um, and lab data, and where there was a, a very high uh, mortality and where there can be no uh, clinical trials um, available. Um, so it is a, a very specific in, in terms of the, the context. And I think that's also where um, it somehow gets uh, misused a lot because uh, these conditions are um, often uh, not given in, in other areas. Um, for example, there have been calls to use Murray in, in uh, tuberculosis uh, or other um, more chronic um, uh, conditions. So it is uh, uh, quite a specific um, terminology. Um, and that also comes uh, with uh, the conditions that I outlined um, regarding, for example, the data collection and uh, 
data sharing. This is why it's called monitored um, emergency use, so that uh, the um, you know, knowledge that is, is gained um, or can be gained through a um, application of such uh, unproven intervention, that this is not lost, but is uh, collected and uh, shared with the world. Uh, and yes, that was an extremely important differentiation that you made, uh, made for us. So there are several other interventions uh, uh, waiting on the, uh, and I would ask Swaleha to uh, uh, briefly um, uh, sum up a few of them and then correctly ask the questions. And by, while she collates them, um, we are uh, really happy to know that uh, Dr. Ross Apshar is actually heading the subgroup, which is connecting the dots for us and we'll be having the, the, the deliberations soon to uh, look at uh, Muri in the context of the ethical framework. So Swaliha, uh, some of the questions please. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm just going to take two questions uh, uh, because of time constraints. Uh, Dr. Natasha Anwar from Lahore has asked uh, uh, that would provision of untested vaccines be permitted under a Muri settings or e EUA settings? Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Andreas, if you could answer that. Okay. Well, um, it it could be in theory if uh, it cannot be done under a clinical uh, trial setting, but um, you know the, there's been a tendency to sort of misuse uh, Murray, although the conditions that I, I uh, enumerated are not met. Uh, sort of a way to circum circumvent uh, clinical trials. And if at all possible, that's not what should be happening. So if there is uh, an untested vaccine that's under development, um, usually I would think it is possible to um, develop a proper clinical trial, where uh, which is uh, still the gold standard to um, to uh, obtain the necessary information for licensure later. Um, so um, I yeah, would tend to say, actually, um, it shouldn't be uh, done under Murray. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I, yeah, actually another related question to this uh, has already been asked by Dr. Mariam, which actually is, uh, is sort of like a question to the, your response, Dr. Andreas. Two questions related to the conditions of approval of MURI. This is Dr. Mariam Hassan from Lahore. How can an IRB assess that it is not possible to initiate trials? This evaluation becomes subjective and based on information provided by the researcher. Also initiating anything during a pandemic is challenging. Uh, and secondly, which is again a related question, LMIC struggle with availability of expertise for analysis of trials so often data analysis, even when done rapidly and shared results in misinterpretation of findings. How can this challenge be addressed for low and middle income countries? Oh yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for these uh, two very important um, um, questions. So um, the first one is uh, to judge the feasibility of uh, clinical trials. And I, I think that is a very good question. It, it's definitely not very easy uh, to make this uh, judgment. Um, but I would argue that ethics committees are used to dealing with very hard questions. So I think what the ethics committee would uh, need from the researchers is uh, that they make a convincing argument. Um, why, uh, what are the reasons why uh, there cannot be a clinical trial or maybe why in a particular context um, there cannot be a trial while there is uh, a bigger one worldwide, uh, why the center in this uh, circumstance cannot participate in, in such a trial. And then uh, the ethics review committee would have to be uh, satisfied with, with this argumentation. Um, the second one I think had to do with uh, capacity building and data analysis. Um, again, I think that is a, a well-known uh, problem which calls for international collaboration and uh, uh, partnership between uh, different countries. Um, 
of course, the, the problem is that uh, there tends to be, in a way, uh, an unequal balance, uh, power balance between researchers from, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, rich countries and, and LMICs. But uh, I would say that uh, there is a, an obligation to build capacity um, and to use this opportunity. There's lots of money around uh, for COVID at, at this moment. So um, I would say there is a obligation uh, on the part of uh, researchers um, from high income countries to uh, build capacity and uh, uh, collaborate with uh, LMICs for the, uh, not only for the data analysis, but also for the research methodology and, and other things uh, in the research enterprise more generally. Okay, I think um, uh, there are several more questions, but uh, we should move on to Dr. Asim. Dr. Uh, Amir? Dr. Asim. Yes, yeah. I think there is a very important question that has come up and it came after I'd actually read out one of the questions. But I think it's a really important question because we saw that we have seen that happening in Pakistan quite a bit. That, um, and this is, I'm assuming Dr. Mohammad Rahil, who stated that although the treatments we use in COVID patients are not evidence-based as far as research parameters are concerned, but as clinicians, patients and their attendants actually demand the use of any treatment, whether unproven to their sick patients, despite full supportive care being already given. So for example, so healthcare professionals have contended with this within the context of Pakistan that they counsel, they tell, but because there is so much information available on the internet, and this happened with related to plasma therapy, which was actually operating within the MURI framework within Pakistan initially, it was the patients and their families who actually started demanding. So how does one address these challenges? Okay, is it fine? I still respond to this, Amir? Yeah, please go ahead, yeah. Okay, very briefly. So again, excellent question. Yeah, I yes. think that exactly what we have been uh, hearing also from our clinical management uh, colleagues that uh, there's a lot of pressure um, by the patients themselves or the families who are um, more and more um, you know, better informed or maybe sometimes ill-informed uh, through the internet. And it's very hard um, um, for physicians who actually also uh, you know, on the inside feel the need to, to do at least something for, for their patients. Um, at the same time, I think uh, one has to be uh, mindful that uh, there's uh, the first ethical principle is to do no harm. So if uh, there is a reason to fear that actually a, a intervention is not beneficial and uh, might have uh, you know, serious side effects like um, hydroxychloroquine uh, turned out to have, um, I think it's also the physician's duty to stand firm and uh, explain to the family that uh, you know, this is not a, a licensed uh, product, it might have uh, big risks, and that uh, you know, the physician cannot in good conscience uh, give in and uh, provide uh, these uh, substances. I'll stop here, and uh, so we have time for the other presentation. Yes, I think that, that was a good uh, shot at that particular uh, last question. Um, uh, there is another twist which uh, we'll address after Dr. Asim's talk, which is when uh, uh, it is the researcher uh, who is also a physician, researcher physician, uh, wearing two hats, is actually pushing for the product, which he's actually also researching as a, um, um, you know, uh, the, the, the golden bullet, but that we'll address later. So I think we'll move on to Dr. Asim and his talk. Uh, Dr. Asim, can you share your slides and... Uh, Yes, uh, 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 you just give me a minute. I share screen. Can you see them now? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. I'm sure there's good morning somewhere too. Assalamu alaikum. Firstly, uh, thank you, Amir and Dr. Moazam and Seabak for inviting me to this seminar. Uh, I hope that all of you are well and hopefully having uh, practicing the social distancing or the physical distancing, as I'd like to call it, and not social distancing, 
and frequently wash your hands and no matter who says what still wearing masks because they help uh, and uh, so what i'll do is i'll go through some of these issues with it that were raised in the questions also uh, and i will be sharing of how people are actually going through uh, the world is going through right now so the world as as amir just uh, had mentioned is and when physicians are take uh, have to then deal with these patients is there is a there's a plethora of of what you see uh, on the um, on the news uh, on advertisements and unfortunately what has happened is that then physicians are put in the position where they have to decide whether they can't give anything or they have to give something and panic prescribing as somebody has called it is is now is now rife and uh, is happening globally everywhere in the world and in pakistan if you would notice like the rest of the world there are many other people who have jumped into apart from the physicians and i'll talk about physicians and researchers who are physician and researchers is uh, is about these miracle cures you can see this advertisement i don't know i just you can't probably read it but it says it's a it's a kind of a i'm not even sure faith healer or or um, or somebody who sits there who says coronavirus ka sharti ilaj which means clearly they have the cure for it and you'll be safe and of course we all know that there has been a plethora of people using uh, sana makki ki chai which is sana leaves it's supposed to be uh, causes a catharsis and they think that works and unfortunately now that people who used to use it as laxative it's disappeared from the market too and it's not just uh, uh, it's not just pakistan it's happening all over the world and i'll sh- and the presidents have many presidents have actually have endorsed it and this is just a one minute video about from but from madagascar first cité dans la réduction de l'éliminé atteint du Covid-19 à Madagascar. So they, there's a he's selling it as the artimether tea uh, to everyone including the rest of the Africa. And he's not he's not the only one. I have to be taking it. I have to be taking it. He clearly hasn't listened to Andrea says yet. From Westchester to New York around the world. He didn't want anything. He just said sir I have hundreds of patients and I give them <coughs> hydroxychloroquine. I give them the Zpac which is Zithromycin and I give them zinc. And out of the hundreds of patients, many hundreds, over 300 patients, I I haven't lost one. He said please keep pressing that sir. I So uh, so it's not only just the the presidents of you know Africa as well as the USA developed versus and the undeveloped but there has been a large amount of even philanthropic organizations which have teamed up with uh, with healthcare institutions in and and have uh, and are and actually advertise or are in the news and they say things way the only way to help treat people certainly help in saving lives and then if you see all these news everywhere else everybody gets uh, involved in it and every patient wants to wants to use it however the researcher uh, who's also the pi has all i mean to his credit has always said that he has never claimed it to be definite therapy uh, but he said you know unfortunately many physicians are now using and this is about plasma therapy right now so and this is an institute which is which is a you know um uh, bone marrow institute with a lot of other things that happens there and he says you know last sunday there were 800 calls from uh, from everywhere in, in in pakistan asking for plasma so when you have so much of of um, uh, plasma being advertised or any other therapy and i'm using plasma just as an example is that that there is so many uh, things happen and unfortunately what happens is that uh physicians then in panic prescribe plasma to people not in a clinical trial not in and murian i'll come to murian in a short while uh, but they they prescribe it and then the, the then the patient or the attendants run around to find where where they can get it and uh, unfortunately uh, what has happened is that people have started asking for money so there is now a small market uh, or a black market of people who want to sell their plasma to the highest bidder 
so much so uh, although although you know the health authorities have made it clear that it is it is still investigational it is it is not treatment nowhere in the world it has been claimed as treatment but it somehow it has it has uh, it has been so widely uh, advertised that people have started having things but it is mixed messaging too so uh, you can see that the, the the whenever somebody speaks and this is this is somebody who's speaking on on um, uh, on a, to a newspaper which say says uh, treated through passive immunization and have recovered so it's treatment people recover that's what what but everybody wants to hear although uh, to his credit he keeps saying that this is uh, uh, the pi keeps saying that it's clear that it is it's a uh, it's a clinical trial we cannot declare it approved there are many stages to go through it but, but but however when you get these mixed messages it, it it's important to realize that people would then uh, interpret it completely differently uh, what you also see is uh, uh, because of this this rampant use of of one of the products that i'm talking about the, the convalescent plasma um, uh, the not only the health authorities have come up but the pakistan society of hematology had to come up with a policy statement saying you know it is still under investigation it's not treatment um, unfortunately they also said that you know many the public is clearly thinks that it is it is the savior and uh, health many health professionals also believe that it is actual treatment rather than still under trial or still something which is which is unregistered for at least for this for this uh, uh, condition uh, there are other studies too um, uh, uh, you know there are studies of uh, observational studies and recovery rates on on hydroxychloroquine and what you see is that they are, they they appear for they appear in news conferences so so somebody has gone through a early phase of a study and they come up with saying you know it really works well with many other things significant recovery rates and so on and so forth however it has never it is still not published nobody has seen it and there is a there's a debate for another day there is so much of literature which is not peer reviewed that has come up and you many of them unfortunately then you when you actually look at them or people look at them they find out that this is this is not uh, not what they had eventually what they had said so it has happened in it is happening in pakistan too so you this is the what the classical treatment is you know even president trump was talking about the, the classical treatment is and i'll show you a prescription on the left of somebody who's who's not in hospital who has a disease and i'm not sure how bad or good the disease was but he is on dexamethasone he is on uh, flexen which is a uh, uh, no molecular weight heparin he is on ascard he is on zinc because the zinc contains zinc he is on calcium he is on nexium uh, which is a, uh, a proton pump inhibitor what he is not on which is um, uh, which is missing is vitamin d because that's that's also on one of the newer things but many other therapies not only in in outpatients but in hospitals people have been using all the things that are listed on the left side so plasma therapy heparin antivirals many antivirals monoclonal antibodies steroids both prednisolone and other things without any evidence and un unfortunately that this leads to the next question is is how can this panic prescribing prompted by uh media and other other reports and demanded by by patients and also and sometimes propagated by physicians and even if they don't want to they are stuck in a hard uh, rock and a hard place as this what you say is uh, what we need is not uh, you know uh, desperate measures we what we need is measured responses as indian journal of medical ethics said that you mentioned so the the next thing is that if you do see covid and we know that covid there is no treatment and and if you have to prescribe logically how do you do it how do you gather evidence and the question is we all know evidence is generated via what we classically known as clinical trials and the issue is and other research methodologies not only clinical trials which is uh, rcts as they are known as by many of them but any other ways of generating evidence and 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 many many still believe that doing clinical trials in disasters or epidemics may be unethical because you are diverting resources however <clears throat> as Re andrea said uh, had mentioned it is clearly an ethical imperative to conduct research and it may actually be unethical 
not to do so, especially when you don't have, uh, uh, don't have enough evidence of prescribing, many of these harmful substances, which, are, which may actually cause more harm than benefit. So uh, is there a, is, is some evidence better than no evidence? And this is a very nice, very old article, which was distributed to uh, most of us, I think Andreas and Alex were written in 1953. So, and, and, and it says, you know, even, even one report is important. The question is how it's monitored and, think, and I, I give you a small example. If, has, if there is a, a disease, which is a, say a hundred percent fortality rate, and if two people are given the substance X and they survive, does this count as evidence? Clearly not in the sense that you will start using it, but at least it gives you one small piece to say what can be worked up further. So any amount of evidence, if, if it is gathered appropriately, may be helpful. Uh, and if when no treatment is available and there is so much of, of prescription writing, you don't want people to keep writing things without documenting what they're doing. And therefore that's where the, the MURI concept comes in, monitored emergency use of uh, unregistered interventions or, or unproven interventions as sometimes it is, it's also called. It, it, has, uh, it, has, uh, it has many meanings. Uh, I mean, MURI by itself could, and I'm quoting from some things that we are already working on, is uh, uh, it has basically three kinds of implications. There is something known as a MURI framework, uh, as we can all see. It's a framework of recommendation conditions or principles where, where you use it, I uh, think, outside a clinical trial in a public health emergency. It is also uh, can be a MURI activity, which is again a non-clinical trial, but this evidence generating. And so in some ways research and not maybe not in the classical classical research paradigm and uh, and and it can, and it is it was meant to have this activity done where where regulatory requirements are not not there so so i'm not sure how can we uh, if you don't if you can't use unregistered intervention and you have the the regulatory authorities have no provision to use it where how does someone who wants to think or is, uh, knows that something may or may not be working will, will try it a uh, MURI protocol is is what what you the ERCs usually sees. It is it is something that happens, um, uh, and somebody says, you know, let's try X in 25, 30, 100 patients and see whether it works or not. It's a uh, 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 it's it is uh, pretty approved, uh, and it's and I'll come back to the compassionate use and we'll describe the use. And it's very similar to what you, what you see in the USA, which is known as emergency use authorization which happens and I will I'll just describe them in, in, in a way. So, so in many countries where there is actually, uh, um, uh, when there is, there is actually a methodology whereby people can use it and, and I'm using USA as an example, it's not the best example, but the USA as an example and the FDA, expanded access and compassionate use are used synonymous. It's usually meant for individual patients, but rarely for groups. And you can use, and this happens when people cannot enter a clinical trial which is already ongoing because their age is different or they have a comorbid condition or something else. And they want to access that medication because it has shown to have some promise at a certain stage. And then as groups, sometimes it can happen, but it requires pre-approval. Authority uh, from drug controlling authorities or authorities that give these approvals and sometimes also from the ethics review board. Uh, uh, and the, the, one of the conditions set in that is that it will not interfere with the initiation or conduction of a trial, which I think in some ways Murie does too. Uh, the off-label use, as Andreas very eloquently explained, is, is basically of a drug which is used for something else and now is being used uh, in a different dosage form in a, for a different indication or a different methodology. And it, this doesn't, it's usually individual, it doesn't require pre-approval, it, it's normally not uh, a research kind of an activity. The emergency use authorization in the USA is specific for, for, for emergencies. And these are, can be many. And so the, the CBRN as described by is, is, is chemical, biological, radiological or nuclear emergency. So biological emergency right now, that like the pandemic that is happening in the US as well as in the rest of the world, 
actually they invoked the emergency use authorization for, for uh, Remdesivir uh, in the pandemic. And it is, this is very, very similar in context to what, what we described as MURI. And clearly in Pakistan, for example, there is no emergency use authorization. So MURI is one option of going through it. And it, as Andrea said, it's not an option to, to use it just because you don't want to go through the rigors of a clinical trial. It's an option to use when there, when there is no clinical trial and the clinical trials cannot be started. And, and therefore you can then start off with the MURI. There is also something in the USA, which is known as the right to try. And it's just an act which is for individual people, they can have access to it. So, so when to initiate MURI? And so, so I have, what I have done is what the seven, um, uh, seven conditions that Back. So he's back. I am I back? Yeah, okay. you're back. You're so, back. Yeah, okay. And are the slides back? Not yet. Are they there? Not yet. So I'm sure I'm so just give me a minute. I'm not sure what has happened. There's something completely disappeared. Okay, can you see Are the it? slides now? Yes. Okay, so so uh, so I have what, what Andreas has said about the seven conditions and what recently PAHO, the Pan, Pan American Health Organization, had done is I put them together with their things to explain better. So one, of course, you need to know that there is there should be no proven intervention, and two, it's extremely important to know that there has to be exceptional circumstances, and usually. Uh, for uh, for areas which has a very high mortality, for example, if you have something which has a hundred percent mortality or a near hundred percent mortality, invoking the MURI protocol is is clearly justifiable. For something not highly or and in a short time, so every everything everything has a mortality, but in a short time, so weeks and months or, or less than a month, that's what we're talking. About. And, and there should be some reasonable uh, opportunity to improve health, then it's involved. Uh, and when, and, and as I think well, Mariam had raised the question, it's, it's clearly difficult for people to understand, but ethics review committee and or health authorities have to make a judgment call of when not to continue doing MURI, MURI, MURI and MURI. So in Pakistan, I think if, if I'm, I'm not in the NBC right now, but, to, but if I can understand there, at least people were trying to have three different groups were having MURIs for plasma. And if we had some kind of a regulation and people could have decided how to do research and collaborate with each other, we may not require that. And so therefore it's, uh, it's not meant to be used as to circumvent ethical oversight or to conduct unproven conditions or interventions into a, and to avoid clinical trials. It's, it's reverse. It's supposed to be a gateway to clinical trials rather than, rather than uh, the end by itself. Uh, there has to be some degree of, of reliability of, of getting that, uh, that it, it, will, it may be helpful. And both, uh, as Andreas had also said, both ethics committees and review committees, and somebody had raised a question, should it be healthcare committees or, or the clinical committees or things? I think most of the things would, would still go to research ethics committee. There was a question panel I saw which said, you know, it takes, it takes very long, um, uh, um, but that's not, the, it, it should not be that way. I know for, for example, the National Bioethics Committee in Pakistan has a turnaround time of less than 72 hours. And so if we can do it, most countries can do it. So, so you have to have those things. And as I just mentioned, there is, there is a methodology of how to adopt the SOPs to rapid review. You need to have uh, uh, adequate resources available to ensure, and the research ethics committee must also um, uh, uh, have a high preference to products 
that should have already undergone certain trials. So for example, convalescent plasma, uh, MURI with the convalescent plasma is much more simpler because convalescent plasma was used for other purposes and the side effects in a bio of itself is also known uh, as compared to completely brand new medication that has not even gone through phase one. So uh, informed consent, of course, is essential and avoiding the misconception and the false perception has to be extreme and it's very, very difficult. So if you see the Pakistan and probably everywhere else in the world, if you have so much advertisement of us for a certain product, it's extremely difficult to know how patients can give true voluntary consent and how physicians can resist the, the urge to do something. Uh, and when very well knowing that it, the likelihood that they may also harm is also very high. But the pressure that they have to go through is, is, is probably uh, very difficult for them to, to go through. Um, it has to be monitored. I mean, the, uh, the beauty has the M in front. And if it's not monitored and you don't know what you've done, uh, then it's very difficult uh, to, so it, it will not generate enough evidence or, um, or the knowledge base that you are trying to gain. So it has to be uh, monitored. And I think there is an obligation on the ERC or, the, or other relevant authorities to ask for that monitoring and to ask, see the data of that monitoring as quickly as possible. So that, so that if it is actually showing great promise, then it, you know that uh, clinical trials for it has to happen. Because it's very difficult, for example, in, a, in COVID where, where, where many people have used convalescent plasma in very different um, uh, uh, patient subgroups, it's very difficult to say if you give it to 300 people and 300 people survived because we all know that many other people survived too. So it's extremely difficult to know whether they actually were beneficial or not. So documentation is, is, is essential. Uh, uh, there are examples, and I'm quoting some examples in, from the Ebola uh, that uh, antivirals and experimental drugs were used in, in, in the Ebola crisis, um, especially by MSF. Uh, in, uh, the, the child, the only child that survived, Nubia, uh, also received many, many therapies, three therapies under, under a MURI protocol. Uh, the antiviral drug that uh, the, her mother received was also under a MURI, MURI, pro, MURI, MURI framework. And so they're, they're, therefore it has been used and, um, uh, and, and it, 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 uh, it, it has documented some effects on it. So in Pakistan right now, I think there are many trials also going on, mainly for convalescent plasma and I know not preview, to pre, I, I'm not sure how many other trials are going on at this time about which have, uh, which have involved the MURI framework. Uh, so my my again, it's it's not it's not like hundred percent correct what I am saying here is but but you look at MURI is it sounds like a pragmatic real life phase two trial, so it's not an explanatory trial under ideal conditions. It is it is you're trying a product to, to see some kind of an efficacy and also safety. However, you presume the safety would have been taken, but it's not the classical definition. But it sounds like a pragmatic phase two trial. So you're looking at a product and you're trying to see whether it works or not um, in a small uh, number of people uh, in the real life scenario. So it's not like a, you know, it's not like the explanatory trial where you have a phase two trial in very limited specific number of people. And so my last slide and is, is about conclusion is that uh, it has, it was never thought to, uh, to be a free pass to, to physicians or to researchers to use. It was supposed to be a bridge to clinical trials, and it was never meant to be as a end by itself. <clears throat> it was supposed to, MURI was in, in some ways was envisaged to prevent widespread unmonitored uh, use of completely unproven intervention, in, especially in countries where there is lack of regulation uh, from, from many authorities. So MURI protocols have to be tritely concerned and only acceptable if there is an infectious disease, it has a high mortality in short period of time, the clinical trials have not started or are unlikely to start in, in future or they are still under completion. And in countries where other options are available, they may not even want to use for uh, MURI or they don't have to invoke the MURI, they have uh, other protocols. And of course, those countries should have some degree of ethics review available. So I end here and thank you very much. And thanks once again for uh, listening to my talk. I hope I am in time. I didn't, uh, I panicked in between because I lost the connection. So I'm not sure whether I overran or not. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asim. Um,
Well, you've given us a lot of information, very relevant information. You can stop your screen sharing now. Um, Done. So, um, so, so that was a lot of very, very relevant information. We've been bombarded by a plenty of questions also. So you've put things in, in, in the perspective um, of Pakistan also. As far as the National Bioethics Committee's research ethics committee is concerned, and you were chairing it up till a short while ago, and now Dr. Saima is uh, chairing Saima Praveza Kalam Sahabar, and there are members of the NBC right now in, in the um, among the audience. Uh, so we've been reviewing um, the protocols in, under the MURI framework, and of course, convalescent plasma trials, at least a couple of them uh, have been run through <laughs> this, and other interventions also, including antiretroviral, antiviral anti, anti uh, drugs and uh, other stuff also. Um, so now the, the question that the NBC also was facing was now that we've got a pool of data, which as you've uh, so rightly pointed out, it's like a fancy phase two in which you've got efficacy and safety. Yeah, it seems to be useful and it seems to be safe in, in, in uh, X number of patients. Now, what do we do? So the, the researchers want to do more. The, the robustness of a MURI framework, where you've term, give, given me two new terms, MURI activity and a MURI protocol. And I think we'd have to wait for uh, the final document in two weeks to be able to understand this further. And this is very useful. Now, having had this data of uh, loosely conducted, uh, at best, loosely conducted clinical uh, research, um, which says that it seems to be safe. The researchers now want to do more of the same, and they use it. Sometimes they use the term expanded access, etc. And we are saying that they that, that you have to go beyond that. And uh, what the REC, uh, REC, the research committee of the National Bioethics Committee, has asked is now do a um, randomized control trial. You have now the patients that it is not a very short-lived um, uh, uh, pandemic, unfortunately, we are in the prolonged sort of phase, although the numbers in Pakistan are thankfully decreasing and hopefully will remain low. However, this is, it would be more of a, 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 a more prudent and more scientific uh, to generate robust uh, data uh, within RCT. So what are your views about that going forward with the data that we have in an RCT framework? So, uh, so my view, I, I think the only people in Pakistan, I can, I'm speaking for Pakistan, is probably the NBC that is seeing all this, this thing, because everybody else probably have no idea who's doing what and how many. If the NBC is looking at these data and you keep seeing three different movies for a certain medication, I think it's incumbent on the, uh, to the NBC to say, no, we will not be reviewing this as MURI anymore. You have to do it as a clinical trial or at least comparative clinical trial to generate some better evidence. And the question is, if if the and I, I, I sitting on one of these conversations, I think that the PI's concerns are that if you are giving plasma or any other medication to people in one center, then it's very difficult not to give it to other people. So then you have to have collaboration with other people. So there are other centers that are doing certain other things. So they may be doing only standard of standard treatment. They may be doing antivirals, or they may be doing something else. And until and unless you have collaboration with different centers, which are doing different things. However, for that, you need to have clear cut written protocols, not fuzzy daddy protocols. So you have to have uh, you know, clear cut um, uh, inclusion criteria, clear, clear endpoints, clear who, who goes where. Only then you can compare the data. And, and I, I think doing the same MURI four times over with 500 patients uh, is, is, is not only a waste of time, it's dangerous and it may not, it may not benefit anyone. So unfortunately, it's on, on you, the NBC. Yeah. It is, it is. I guess that's that's one of the reasons why we are having this panel discussion. Yes, Andreas? Yeah, if I can just uh, add. So first of all, I completely agree with uh, everything that uh, Asim uh, just said. Um, one of the lessons that uh, we have learned uh, since 2014 is actually that um, the data collection uh, for Murray is very haphazard and very unsystematic. And the sharing is even uh, you know, uh, you know, happening even less. And so uh, one of the things uh, that are under discussion is uh, whether someone, maybe WHO or another competent authority um, would establish a registry for uh, interventions um, that are uh, provided under the Murray framework. 
so that uh, one would be able to uh, more systematically have an overview of uh, what is happening, let's say, on, on, on plasma. And that uh, either within a country like Pakistan, everyone you know, knows what's going on at the different clinics and has, has access to the data or can at least ask the different uh, you know, physicians uh, providing these therapies or even better at the national level um, so that we actually have uh, bigger numbers that can then inform the appropriate design of a clinical trial. Over. So uh, I think we've got a significant number of questions lined up. So Swalia, can you please sift through some of them and, and pose them for our yeah. speakers? Actually, something connect, connected to what Dr. Asim uh, said earlier about uh, that, you know, you should not be having uh, muries of 500 patients. So is there any limit when uh, WHO conceived of this idea? Is there any specific lower limit or upper limit uh, for uh, a number of participants that can be enrolled within, the, within a muri activity? Uh, a defined sample size to say so uh, either yeah. either of you can answer yeah um no there's no explicit number but uh, certainly the uh, authors of the guidance uh, had uh, sort of a, a few you know single patients in mind maybe a handful of patients um and uh, 500 uh, from my point of view would clearly be too much you know that that should definitely be, be a clinical trial over uh, so I, I think also it depends upon uh, the the mortality rate and the infectivity rate of of, uh, of an epidemic. For Ebola, four or five or ten or handful would be would probably give you some answer. But maybe in 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 certain uh, usage or in COVID, you may require slightly more more numbers. But clearly, uh, you know, you know, getting three hundred patients or more and continuously to get uh, asking for. What, what they are confused with expanded use, so you have decided that it works and therefore now add another 300, that's clearly out of the question. So it's, it is meant to be for limited number of people, um, uh, individual to maybe a handful or maybe slightly more, but not hundreds of people. Thank you. Another question that Dr. Mariam Hassan has asked from Lahore is, uh, can you please also comment on the issue of difficulty in assessing clinical uncertainty around evidence during a pandemic? Clinical uncertainty or equipoise is usually the basis for randomization in RCTs, and RCT model is considered the gold standard for generating evidence. However, the evidence is dynamic and changing very rapidly, and even platform trials with adapt adaptive design struggle to keep up. So how, how does one uh, address this uh, issue? So uh, I'll go first. Uh, so in in uh, in epidemics or in conditions where you have nothing as treatment, it's easy. Uh, what becomes difficult is how which ones to try with the standard of therapy. Uh, for example, like in Ebola, you may have ten different uh, ten different um, uh, um, products that may or may not be effective. The question is, unfortunately, well-designed adaptive uh, trials are clearly answers the can give better answers quickly and not put people into those uh, uh, two groups where, the, where you're actually seeing it. It can only happen when, when, when things move quickly for diseases. Well, for example, it can't be done for cancer trials. Uh, if, if your mortality occurs over, over months and years, then, then to do adaptive designs is very, very difficult. For rapid uh, random uh, randomization for adaptation it has to have a, sh uh, a disease that has a shorter uh, interval of cure as well as death so that you can then go to the, the trial. And yes, it's difficult, but that's how all research, all good research is difficult. One has to unfortunately make it. Andreas, if you want to add something. Yeah, I agree, uh, but maybe, uh, yeah, just to say that again, this is an excellent question and actually one that has been uh, debated uh, during Ebola quite a bit. And uh, Philippe Collin, who was the chair of the 2014 panel, he actually wrote a paper in 2018 in the, I think it was the Journal of Medical Ethics on Ebola trials. And he was arguing that clinical equipoise actually breaks down when the mortality rates are high and there's uh, no cure. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm not sure I would completely agree. And I don't know, he was uh, certainly also being uh, polemic. But uh, definitely that is a, a big concern. It's very uh, hard uh, to assess uh, 
uh, equipoise uh, in, in uh, these situations. And that is a very difficult situation uh, for the uh, research ethics committees, especially under uh, time pressure. Over. Okay, so there, there is a question by Mushtaba Kadri about the internal validity. He's concerned about the internal validity of some of the trials being conducted in the country. He's talking about Pakistan, I believe. Uh, he says, who is looking at the scientific integrity? Uh, is it NBC or any other body? And I think I can respond since I'm uh, involved in both these things. So, um, um, Mr. K um, uh, Dr. Kadri um, or Mr. Kadri, um, the, um, uh, there are two bodies. The National Biotics Committee looks at the ethics. Uh, and uh, but uh, unscientific research is also an ethical research. So obviously we're looking at the technical aspects also. This then goes after we've approved it. This then goes to the uh, uh, Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan, DRAP, which has a specific committee called the uh, uh, Clinical Science Scientific Committee, uh, which looks at the science of it. So there is another panel um, uh, which looks at once it is approved by that can the can the research begin. So there are two levels of of scrutiny. Uh, similarly, the research um, uh, data also has to come back to these. Uh, the, the results have to come back to these two committees. Um, unfortunately, what is happening is that the data because of the excitement uh, and I'm using that rather loosely of the researchers, it goes to the media first. So we actually find out from the media from Facebook. Uh, also, uh, that uh, a certain university calls us a high ranking government official uh, to reveal re data and results, which may be actually 180 degrees opposite to what they have been coming in from the rest of the world about that particular product. So uh, that there are concerns about that also. Um, the um, uh, 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 both um, the speakers have spoken uh, spoke about the uh, the uh, pressures on the researchers. Um, uh, the, the researchers have also created pressure among themselves on themselves also by going and involving the media. The media has hyped up a lot of things that within, and we've had reports in, in the public that within three months we will have a vaccine in Pakistan. And how can that be possible even? But um, so such, such kind of outlandish um, um, statements in the media also increase the, the, the pressures, not only on the researchers, but also on the reviewers and the NBC as well as the, the DRAP. Both these committees have of course resisted any such, such, um, such pressures, but they are there. So back to you Swalia for more questions. Uh, there's this one question from Dr. Ikram Bernie, which is not exactly related uh, to MURI, but more uh, research designs in general with respect to COVID. Uh, Dr. Ikram Bernie is from Oman, so we have a great audience from all over the world. So uh, uh, he says that artificial intelligence can be used to collect information on efficacy and toxicity of investigational agents very quickly. What is the take of WHO on the use of AI instead of prospective uh, ra randomized control trials? Uh, so maybe Dr. Andreas, you can answer that. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, question. So um, WHO uh, about a year ago established an uh, expert group on ethics and artificial intelligence uh, for health. And uh, that is one of the projects that is going a bit slower, I have to say, because of COVID. Uh, we've been sidetracked, especially also um, by um, the uh, topic of using apps for uh, uh, contact uh, tracing and tracking. Um, I strongly believe that AI is uh, revolutionizing um, research, especially in the labs. We've had uh, testimony from uh, pharma companies um, that uh, indicated that uh, maybe um, in 10 or 20 years, actually, there will be no more need for lab research. Everything will be simulated by computers and, and by AI. Um, in terms of uh, uh, clinical um, trials, I'm actually not so sure um, whether, you know, AI can uh, really um, you know, obviate the need for, for these uh, trials. Um, I, I do think that they are, uh, at least at the moment, uh, still necessary. And uh, AI can probably help um, with the uh, statistical inferences and so forth. But I have to admit that I'm not an expert on that uh, precise question. 
Over. Okay. Uh, one more question before actually Dr. Amir, you can wrap up or if there are any other comments from uh, Dr. Asim or Dr. Andreas. But uh, given that there is so much, situ uh, given uh, that, you know, we've now fairly well in, we're fairly well into the pandemic. And I think that's what Dr. Natasha has, all, all, uh, has asked a question, which I'm going to read out loud, is trying to get at that should now we have muri at all for COVID-19. Now that you know, we we know that it's not going anywhere for a while. At least we will have cases for a bit. So, so what would, uh, what is your opinion on that? So, uh, if I can take that initially, I mean, you can't completely throw muri out because it depends upon what product you're trying to investigate. For example, for convalescent plasma, I think muri should be clearly out. But if there is another new product, and which by the time you are setting up a trial, and you expect that there will be a delay. Uh, in the clinical trial. So yes, your default setting should be clinical trial. There is no doubt on that. But it's not necessary to say that there should be no MURI at all. The question is, if it's a new product, if something new has come up, something new has to be tried, uh, and the setting up of a clinical trial may take weeks or months or I don't know how much time. And uh, so therefore, there may still be a need for MURI. But clearly for products that have been, that, that have been uh, reviewed and have gone through, uh, MURI or other clinical trials every, anywhere else and or and or are going through a clinical trials in Pakistan, there is no point to having MURI. Over. Yeah, there's not much uh, to add on this, uh, just to say that uh, I think MURI is really the conduit that can prepare a clinical trial, uh, as we said, for small numbers. And uh, once there are uh, some indications that something uh, could work, um, the best way forward is to actually set up a, a proper clinical trial. Over. So I think very well said, um, um, Andreas, that uh, it's a conduit. It's the it's the way towards the the goal. The goal may be attained by a more robust um, um, methods and applications, and we have them already. Um, so one thing we've actually also learned is that uh, the importance of a um, uh, clinical trials registry in in the broader sense, and also one that looks at the MURI trials, because right now, the um, uh, some a role that probably the Pakistan Health Research Council should be playing uh, uh, is to actually uh, be a repository of all this data which is there uh, in these two committees that I just mentioned, the National Bioethics Committee right now and the uh, uh, Clinical Studies Committee of the uh, Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan. So these two committees are there. However. Uh, a, at the national level, there is, needs to be some sort of a data correlation so that we can actually learn from this. And it does our learning doesn't stop now. It actually starts and builds up beyond our position right now. So that is very important to, for us to learn. We have in the past, so this is, as I said in the initial preamble, that um, um, uh, the, the pandemic has been a very important learning experience for all of us in various aspects. Uh, the National Bioethics Committee learned how to do rapid reviews before the first, uh, and we were expecting uh, an onslaught of, of research protocols before the first protocol arrived on our uh, in our inbox. We had actually developed a, um, a uh, terms of reference for a rapid turnaround review, which takes 72 hours. And our meetings actually take place generally now at 10 p.m. and we have one meeting tonight at 10 p.m. because that's the only time that people get home and have had dinner and are free to talk. So um, so one, one so we, we've done one on Eid Eve. Um, so, so this is how the, the, the rapidity has, has uh, actually we've been able to do that and, and collect this data. But uh, there, there needs to be a national level body which can be the Pakistan Health Research Council, which actually becomes a repository and we need to, to, to take it from there. So I think we've, um, this has been a very useful um, uh, uh, interaction with the two of you. You uh, uh, certainly answered a lot of questions and given us a lot of food for thought also for, for taking this forward. And um, as um, Swalia was saying, uh, COVID is uh, here to stay for a little while. So, so are these uh, webinars. Um, uh, which we are doing in collaboration as a collaborative center of WHO. 
and uh, we'll we'll be coming up with four, with more um, more such seminars in the in, in the in the future. So from on on behalf of the Center of Biomedical Ethics and Culture at SIUT, on my behalf, Professor Farhad Mohsen's behalf, and behalf of all our faculty, thank you very much uh, to the two panelists, and thank you very much for all the attendees. And it's been a very good uh, good, good interaction. Thank you very much. Thanks Bye. for the invitation. Thank you.